one particular group that are interested in the questions of origins of life are those who are involved in the intelligent design movement. Um, now, we'll, we'll maybe come on to talk about, you know, theological aspects of this whole debate as well in a moment's time. But I have read some friendly critiques of, uh, of your work from that particular side of the, uh, the, the aisle, um, uh, suggesting that maybe there are, you know, some ways in which simply thermodynamic forces and the way it interacts with different molecular structures can get you to, to something that starts to approach some sort of organized systems and so on. But, but as one person said, uh, it's possible in principle, but impossible in practice. You simply aren't going to get the kind of environment in an early Earth situation where you would be able to, to sort of amass the kind of amount of information before it quickly degrades again for life mm -hmm. to get going. Now, I don't know, is this the kind of thing where it's, again, it is possible in principle, but, but are the odds stacked against it? What, what's your sort of answer to those who say... Mm -hmm. You, you, you can't get information just from sort of a, a physical process in that way. I, I don't want to speak in too much generality because I, I guess uh, the devil often is in the details um, with these kinds of arguments. But I think when that argument is made with an appeal to intuition, it's easy to make it sound like a reasonable claim that maybe it's just too unlikely. But uh, in the examples that I've encountered thus far where it's possible to dig into the details and, and try to develop a more specific theoretical study of that question in a particular context, it doesn't seem to me like that's the difficult thing. And, and I think that one of the things that maybe is hard here is that it's, and, and this gets back to what I was saying before about the question of where the sort of first information comes from that brings about order in the rest, uh, is that one person's information is another person's noise, right? That if I showed you a hundred randomly chosen barcodes, right? Those randomly chosen barcodes are clearly in one sense, very different than most other possible barcodes of that same kind that you could make, right? A barcode, let's say has a hundred choices of whether to be a black line or a white line. So that's, you know, 100 coin tosses if you're making random barcodes. So you could have two to the 100 different possible barcodes, which is a very big number. And if I only showed you a thousand of them or even a billion of them, that's a tiny fraction of all possible barcodes. So on the other hand, if I just start showing you a billion randomly chosen barcodes, you're not going to be able to see much that's interesting in them. They will seem to you like they were chosen randomly because you don't have kind of a theory of what they all have in common with each other. So you have many situations where something on the one hand can be highly correlated, highly specialized, highly separate and different than a truly random sampling from all the space of possibility, but where unless you have already kind of latched onto what's particular and special and different about that subgroup, it'll appear to, to be random to you. And I think that often is hiding in the background in some of these discussions, because really when we're talking about information and fine tuning of relationship between matter and an environment or adaptation or things like that, what we care about is the likelihood of being in some shape over here with the matter that we're interested in with respect to the particularity of the, the environment or the source or the, the driver that's bringing that about. And so that driver could be randomly chosen at the outset. And then we actually have a paper um, uh, that is really about this. You take a bunch of random barcodes, but there's still a small fraction of the total possible space of possible random barcodes, right? You take a small fraction of that, but still many random barcodes, and you start showing them to a collection of interacting matter. And over time, the dynamics of that, as it sort of bangs around with the forces barcoding it over and over again and pushing on it in different random ways becomes adapted to that particular set of barcodes such that if you now start showing new barcodes to the system, you get this big spike in activity and the energy absorption changes. And in a sense, the system has learned that its environment has a certain pattern to it. And then when the environment has changed in a way that we wouldn't recognize because it would just look like another random barcode, the system that's evolved in that environment has a response that demonstrates it's detected the difference. So the, the barcodes at the outset can be randomly chosen. They don't have to be specially designed or, or have a particular pattern to them uh, as long as they just have some, what, what in a physics term we call quench disorder, that there's some randomly chosen initial factors that have gotten nailed down 
And now that's sort of like a knobbly substrate of a particular random shape that the rest of the matter has to deal with. And, and I think that's the thing that we can start to think about in terms of you know, the origins of life kinds of discussions as well, because it's true that once you live in a world with DNA and, and RNA and, and there are all these relationships that form among those pieces, we can say that the DNA sequence here looks highly specialized to accomplish this and the RNA sequence there looks highly specialized to accomplish that. But at the outset, it might be that all you need to kind of catalyze the first process of deepening of fine-tuned relationship on the molecular side, on the DNA RNA side, you might just need an environment that has particular fixed facts about it that could have been generated, so to speak, much more at random. Like there was some supernovas and you got this much yeah. carbon and this much nitrogen, I, et cetera. I, I, I'll be interested in Paul's response to this as well. But, but even as you're speaking there, it's very natural, isn't it, when we're talking about this, to almost anthropomorphize the, the process and say, the, you know, the environment wants to find or the, the, the chemicals want to do this. And they uh, and, and that, that's where this whole thing causes me so much confusion, because I'm sort of well, there's nothing about inert chemicals and physical forces that says we want to get life at the end of this process. And yet that's what the process is, as far as you're concerned, Jeremy, seem to drive it towards. It wants to find ways to, you know, uh, harness the energy and and to become more efficient and to then you know start to replicate itself in these patterns and so on. Well, just to comment on that, I think I think what it's about is whether you can argue for something that looks like an optimization principle that comes from simpler rules of how everything is behaving. So, in the Darwinian case, the optimization principle we have is we have things that copy themselves, and so if they're able to successfully reproduce, and that happens over and over again. And then they pass on their traits to their progeny. And so you end up getting this optimization principle where you're optimizing being good at surviving and reproducing, right? In the material context, in the more primitive kind of physical context, you don't have an argument for doing that. But you do find that in, from very generic physics, you can get optimization principles that also end up producing behaviors that in their endpoint end up looking like they wanted to do something. So you end up, you can take very primitive physical circumstances and say, this thing is trying to minimize the amount of energy per unit time it absorbs from its environment. It's very easy to make a physical system that works that way. So if you have many building blocks, you have a complicated pattern in some external forcing that it's getting from the surroundings, then being good at not absorbing energy is actually a pressure to find a very special particular shape that has that property. And that looks in a sense, like machine learning, right? Machine learning is just a different way of searching a high dimensional space of possibilities to optimize an input output relationship. So if you have a particular pattern in your environment and you're trying to adapt a relatively primitive physical property to that pattern, but you have a big library of combinations of building blocks that can do that, you can get something at the end that looks like yeah. it was trying to do that. And, and so it, it evokes the idea of function or design almost automatically.